All right. Um, so if you've been following my YouTube shorts, this is the homemade thermoacoustic Sterling engine. I've finally come to a design that I'm happy with. Um, it is all one solid piece. It is uh, 304 stainless steel. There are no moving parts except for the diaphragm on the top. It uses heat to create sound through a stack. Um, and then that sound moves the diaphragm up and down. I do use a 25 millimeter by five millimeter neodymium magnet. I can double up on this, uh, but obviously that the larger the weight, the slower it will move. Um, total RPM, I can show you today, but it should be around 2000. Um, and then I have some custom um, Littinger alternator magnet wire spools. So these also have the tri-clamp fitting um, and they are, you know, formed in a way that allows the diaphragm to move up, but also the magnet to uh, go in the center. If you're not sure, or if you don't know what a tri-clamp is, super common in a lot of different industries, including brewing, uh, where it has this groove on top. These washers fit on here. The, that same fitting is also on the bottom. And it's really an engineer's best friend because they fit like Legos, right? So just to give you an example, here's just another tri-clamp fitting you can buy from really anywhere. It'll fit just perfectly right on top there. And then these clamps are just, again, industry standard. And you can fit these items completely airtight. Um, you know, and sanitary. they're actually called sanitary fittings. So it's really for like brewing and stuff like that, right? Um, but super cool for adding things to the engine if you want. Like for example, this right here would be two linear alternators. So everything just fits again with these clamps on top of each other. And then you could run two at once. That would either be for um, parallel or in series. If you wanted higher current or higher voltage. But just wanted to show that concept. Um, and then the other part of that, and really the purpose that I made this thing was for either like a campfire or like a wood stove. It's obviously all stainless steel, so this is not your typical Sterling engine that, you know, it's made of glass and you can light it with like a flame candle or, you know, like a alcohol candle. Um, this one does require a higher amount of heat. I have a blowtorch to show you today, but that's because I wanted to put it inside the middle of the campfire, right? And so, you know, if you put one of a regular Sterling engine in there, it would just burn up. Um, but if you could get something like this, right, this is what I'm envisioning to go on top of a uh, wood stove. So you'd either like weld this or fit it in some way. It would sit right there. Again, this is the tri-clamp fitting. And then you could literally clamp your engine to the top of either like a barrel for burning or whatever it is. I mean, really, the, you know, the world is your oyster with this one. But the fittings are on both ends, I think it's pretty neat. But let's get into the d details of what the, sir, what the engine is. So um, I do have a drain port here for the water valve or the water jacket. This is a water jacket. There's water inside right now. Um, the way this works is you'll heat the bottom. There is a stack is what they call it in the center. And then up here is the cold end. And so that cycle or that thermodynamic process is also known as a Hoffler tube. Um, there's some really cool videos and research papers on that. I definitely recommend some research on there. And then the, the, um, the valve is one thing that I was working on. So I originally started with a water check valve. Um, and there's a YouTube video on there and I go into pretty good detail about why it may or may not be the most powerful engine. I do agree with that original video in the concept, except for uh, there were some major problems with using a water check valve. Most of it is that when you heat it up and when it cools down, it creates a vacuum and then it'll draw all that water back in and stops the engine. So using that idea of why a water check valve was so useful, and just to summarize really quickly, the check valve allows the perfect amount of air to be inside the engine at any given time, right? So it will self-regulate. And as you can see, I have the tube here, and then I've got a small duckbill valve up here, right? So any excess air, and by excess, I mean as air is heated, air will expand and take up more space. So that, you know, the super hot campfire you put this into, or wood fire, whatever it is, um, the air inside is going to expand, and eventually it will create some kind of vacuum. 
Um, this allows the excess air to escape to the duct valve, valve without any air coming back in. And then this tube is very critical because again, the way that this thing works is the hot air rises and when it gets to the top, it's colder relatively, and then it compresses and falls. And so it's this constant cycle. And so we're mimicking that cycle with this tube as well. So the hot air will come up through here. The really hot air will escape. And then the air that's, it's like farther from the rest of the engine. This really is much colder than even this part. Um, so it will compress and go back into the engine. So we have this constant cycle of up and down, up and down. I've done the math on it. I think it's about uh, one cubic centimeter of air that is actually running this engine. So um, you have to basically, when this thing is running, there is a vacuum and the vacuum is pulling the diaphragm down. And then as that air is compressed and creating the vacuum, it's then heated up at the bottom. It expands and it pushes the diaphragm up. That happens 2000 times a minute, if not more. So uh, today I have a tachometer, I have an amp meter, and I also have a volt meter. I've already done a video on the temperature. The temperature down here is about 212. And this one was about 105, right? So relative difference uh, between the two. So um, I actually have one ready to go here. So I already spoke about the custom fittings and just versatility of it. It's 18 inches tall, by the way, it's a two inches wide. Uh, this is one with a diaphragm already on top of it. I custom made these diaphragms, um, give you an example. They are high temperature silicone. I've tried all sorts of different diaphragms and they've all failed, um, including latex and thermoplastics and everything else, right? It's just, it just gets too hot, right? It's, it's, if, it la if it works, it'll only work for a little bit. These diaphragms continue to work and you know, unless you puncture them or something like that. Um, so let's turn it on. So since this is a thermal acoustic engine, if you did not want to use the diaphragm where the diaphragm was not on this, you would start hearing the noise that it makes. Um, and it is a lot of noise, really. So you could use other forms of energy generation, either like pistons, You can even use like pistons or whatever else, um, including like the a speaker. You can use the speaker as well to absorb the energy. I, I find that the linear alternator is probably the easiest method to use. So here is our uh, linear alternator, really without the magnet. So the magnet wire spool. I've got a bridge rectifier here. It's up to three amps. I'm gonna just put it right on top here. And then I guess a quick example, I made a video of this yesterday, but here's one with a coil built in and then some LEDs as well. You can see, oh, I've cooled it down too much. There you go. 
So. Gonna clamp it on just to make sure nothing happens to it. Okay, this is not going anywhere. Let's get a voltage measurement. Thirty volts. You could probably get it higher. Let me just point it at you really quickly. Let's put some more heat on this thing. So the highest I've gotten it, it was 45. The problem with using a blowtorch is that it's a very centralized heat. When you put this inside of a campfire or something that has circumferential amount of heat, um, it operates much quicker and much more powerful. But still, 34 volts, that's great, right? So, we have that. Or you know what, actually, we can leave this on and we'll do an amp measurement so we can do the wattage live. So this is an amp meter, got it set to the um, two amp, which is like the decibel. I don't have a light on this one, so you'll have to, this is our power cord, right? So we're surrounding it with the power cord. Can you see that? 1.9, 1.6, can you see that? 1.2, 1.1. Um, again, if I heat it up, maybe we can see more. The whole point of this steel construction is that you can put it inside of a, a campfire and you can leave it for hours. This right here might be super hot, maybe 200 something degrees. Over here, like not hot at all. I mean, even here it's not hot. The water is doing a great job as a phase change material. You can cover it up here. 1.5, so if we do 1.5 as an average and we're at 31 um, watts times amps, I don't know what that is, it's probably around 60 watts right now. Maybe I'm wrong, somebody can tell me in the comment section. Uh, but the next thing that I wanted to show you, if we've gotten the watts or the amps and the volts out, let's pull out the tachometer. Let's see how fast we're actually moving. Well, my tachometer says we're moving zero times per minute. <laughs> it's also giving me a battery issue, so maybe that's the problem with the tachometer. But, as you can tell, we're not moving zero times per minute. I have other videos that have shown the RPMs on it. But, uh, yeah, this is the total engine that I have. Um, as you can tell, I have another one over here. Uh, this model is available on my website, which is Long Earth Society, kind of like Flat Earth Society, but Long Earth Society. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.